All right, well, thank you all for coming. My name is Walter Edwards. I'm the director of the Humanities Center. I'm pleased to, um, to invite to, to welcome you to this talk uh, by my young friend and colleague, uh, Andrew Newman. Um, he is um, an associate professor of anthropology here at Wayne, and he has been here at Wayne since 2011. He, soon after he graduated with his PhD from the City University of New York's Graduate uh, Center. I mean, the anthropology department has a very brilliant department with lots of um, outstanding faculty. And the, the reason for that is that they, they are very good to go after uh, outstanding talent. So he was um, invited and I'm glad he came. He, the little bio he, he sent us, he's a very modest young man, but uh, the little bio he sent us mentioned that he served as a member of the Humanities Center uh, Advisory Board from 2018 to 2020. I'm delighted that he mentioned that because it gives me an opportunity to thank him for his outstanding service in the Humanity Center. Um, uh, he was always uh, somebody whose opinion was uh, very thoughtful, uh, not very talkative, but whenever he said something, it was very profound and he was a very good uh, member of our advisory board. So I thank you, sir. Much thank appreciated. Um, he is, um, he hit the ground running uh, just nine years out of uh, graduating from the, the PhD program. He is an associate professor and he has two books. Um, one of them is entitled An Landscape of Discontent, Urban Sustainability in Immigrant uh, Paris, um, published in 2015. And that is a book that examined how uh, France's po post-colonial politics played out in environmentally focused urban planning in the city of Paris. The book was so well received that it was a runner up for the Rappaport Award in Environmental uh, Anthropology. And more recently, he and um, Detroit activist uh, Linda Campbell and um, the geographer Sarah Safransky, uh, they uh, published a book via Wayne State University Press entitled The People's Atlas of Detroit. Uh, it is an edited volume which profiles uh, activist, activist, activist work in the city around themes of environmental justice, governance, food justice, and uh, housing and land. His presentation today uh, gives us a view into a new direction for his work. It is based on archival research in Paris, uh, funded by the Wender Grand, Grand Foundation for Anthropolog Anthropological Research. The talk is entitled Empire's Garden, Anthropology and the Racialization of a Vision in the Fin de Secule uh, Paris. So in case I butchered that uh, pronunciation, it, it, mean, it means something about the late 19th century uh, in Paris. So thank you all for coming. And I now turn the floor over to Professor Andrew Newman. Thank you so much, Walter. You give such generous presentations. So that alone is just a great reason to come and hear you introduce a talk. So it's really great to be here and it's really great to have the space with some colleagues to share some work. Um, I'm just gonna begin by sharing an image and I'll say more about my project overall in a minute, but I'm just gonna start off by sharing an image and I'll just go ahead and um, do an actual kind of slideshow. Um, you all see the right side of the slide. You see the front stage view, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so 
The phot this photograph is one of relatively few out there that documents an ethnographic exhibition held at the Jardin d'Acclimatation in Paris. That means acclimatization garden. And I'll say more about why it had that name in a minute. Um, and these were held um, between 1877 and 1908. So for about three decades, um, there were a series of um, revolving exhibitions exhibited exhibiting um, indigenous people um, from around the world, from Africa, South America, Asia, North America, as examples of racial difference um, to be presented before the French public. Um, leading anthropologists of the day, including Paul Broca and Adolf Bloch, along with other members of the Société d'Anthropologie de Paris, um, played a crucial role in providing the scientific justification for these displays, um, which proved immensely popular with the public and these actually predated and probably inspired um, some of the more well-known ethnographic exhibitions you might have heard about at the World's Fairs in Paris and Chicago. Um, this particular image um, most likely comes from a Somalian-themed display that, a, that was held in 1891. Um, it's a disturbing image, and I think one of the things that I'm grappling with in this project is how to deal with images that convey a level of visual violence and the politics of representing that. Of, and some of them are more disturbing than this one and some of them are less, but um, that's one of the things that I'm grappling with in this project actually. Um, that it shows a, um, a black woman and a child appearing to be in captivity actually. You can see there's a fence there. Um, and in fact, I think in addition to that circumstance and one of the aspects of the display that's if you know what you're looking at, at least what's difficult to see is that um, there's a kind of violence or a, there's a kind of violence of the gaze. I think that's very palpable in a lot of these images. Um, and in particular, this one, um, because most images that are taken of the Jardin de Acclimatation um, displays are presented from the standpoint of the viewer outside looking in. And this is one that kind of shows both sides of the fence and really shows the display um, in that respect. Um, it's also, of course, the fact that there are goats in this image um, adds to the sort of degrading aspect of it as well. Um, animals associated with many of the cultures, peoples, and regions on the display were often brought along with people um, and displayed as these broader groups known as troops. Um, and this woman, although alone in the image, was a part of um, a large group of people who were brought from Somalia. And I'll talk more about these economies and logistics underlying these displays in a few minutes. Um, if you focus on the people outside of the fence, um, what you'll see there is a crowd of white onlookers consisting of men, women, and children sort of gawking at her. And some appear to be getting trying to get the attention of her child. Um, if you look, the onlookers wear smiles, um, but it's really difficult to tell whether those smiles are grins of affection and connection, as in maybe trying to get a smile out of her child or perhaps um, those of mockery or cruelty. And based on the historical sources that attest to the behavior of these crowds, it really could have been either one. Um, just off to the right, um, there's a uniform and employee of the Jardin who's keeping a kind of close look on an interaction between the woman and the crowd. And those interactions could be a point of contention and anxiety on the part of the organizers. Um, we know that from what the sources we have that uh, members of the public sometimes abused people in these displays. But what appears to have irked the authorities the most actually were instances when um, people in the displays kind of broke character or departed from a kind of unwritten script of distant otherness and connected with people in the crowds. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about the engagement between the crowd and the people in the displays quite a bit. Um, as for the woman at the center of the spectacle, her attention is not focused on the onlookers, but if you can see, depending on your screen or how it looks on your end, um, on the camera itself, and she's the only person in the image looking at the camera. Um, she appears kind of, the look on her face, you know, it's difficult to make out, but she appears troubled, uh, not surprisingly, perhaps fearful, but also indifferent to the crowd and more focused on the camera. It's almost as if she's making a connection to us on the other side of the lens when you look at the image in a high resolution. Um, she seems utterly alone in this image, though we know she traveled with at least more than a dozen individuals, probably likely members of her family, extended family, Ken group. Uh, we don't know her story specifically, but um, and we don't know her name, um, but I will share the stories of other people who came to Paris who were kind of still on the same side of this fence with her in a little bit. 
Um, so um, that's sort of an introduction to the scope and the stakes of what I'm talking about today. Um, today's talk is kind of one of my first presentations on this topic. Um, it's based on archival work I've conducted over the last couple of years. And I'm gonna really speak at a very general level because in my experience, um, the Jardin de Acclimatation exhibits are not that well known, especially in the United States. They're a little bit known in France, but not particularly well known in the United States. So I'm just gonna to actually talk at a really broad level at first and just talk about essentially how did this place and these displays themselves come into existence. And then I'll share a little bit of the research um, I've done about the stories of some of the individuals involved in these displays, including how they arrived and what the meanings were around their participation. Um, next, I'll talk about the kind of varied and complex ways that the members of the Parisian public interacted with and made sense of these displays. And of course, the Parisian public was varied, right, in terms of gender, class, and ethnicity and national identity. And I'll talk a little bit about some of those differences. Um, and the last thing I'll briefly touch on is the anthropological interest and role in these displays, which was a significant, um, although I'm just gonna talk about it in a small bit at the end. Um, the anthropologists were polygenist scientific racists. That means they were scientific racists that actually believed humanity was not just made up of real races. They believed in, they, they, they weren't just believers in race as a reality. They actually believed in different species of humans. Um, they um, saw their, as their mission to sort of use these displays to sort of teach the Parisian public to see race as a reality. And um, so for anthropology, these were sites of race making in many respects. And they were also a site of disciplinary formation in the history of the field of anthropology. In fact, the displays um, on a busy day, they could draw well over 10,000 people in a day. That's probably not the case in this picture on this instance, but um, on weekends and in summers, for example, it could be well over 10,000 people in a day and in a couple isolated instances, um, sometimes three times that number in a single day. So these were very popular exhibitions in Paris, very much a part of the visual culture of Paris at the time. But in our broader scholarly memory of what Paris was about in the late 1800s, somewhat marginalized from the narrative of modern Paris too. Um, so, um, and I know this is, I think, I might have mentioned work that I'm continuing to do. And so, you know, it's fun to share it in an early stage. There'll be a point where I'll just tell you right out that I've run into kind of, how would you put it? Um, the, tra the trail has run cold from an archival point of view. Although I think for a lot of things that I'm discussing, I, I have see ways forward that I'll find out more. Um, so much of what I'm presenting is preliminary. And of course, it's much easier to tell the story like I will in a minute of the sort of elites in Paris who presided over these displays of which there's a lot of sources on. Obviously, um, the colonial archives reproduce the colonial order in many respects. So sources on people in the displays are harder to find, but I've found sideways ways to get at some of those stories. And there's some other scholars doing important work on that too, for sure. So um, the Jardin d'Acclamatation was born out of a meeting um, between a scientist and a politician. Um, the former, Isidore Geoffroy Saint-Hilaire, was almost entirely known for being the son of a prominent biologist, um, Etienne Geoffroy Saint-Hilaire, who was in turn known as an advocate of Lamarckian views of evolution, which placed a strong emphasis on the power of environmental and climatological factors to shape the development of species. And in particular, Lamarckians, Lamarck's excuse me, embrace of the notion that characteristics acquired by individuals could be inherited um, and passed on into a species. And um, these led to a notion of evolution um, that were, um, a, or a notion of the mechanics of evolution inherit and inheritance and species change that were, um, well, I guess the timeframes that Lamarckians thought were possible for evolution to operate were much faster than we now know is possible. Um, and that becomes relevant with this garden and what this garden was about. Um, Isidore, the younger Geoffrey Saint-Hilaire, advanced quickly through the ranks of French academia. Um, in contrast to his father, he had an applied, if not entrepreneurial vision of what evolutionary science could do, particularly in this Lamarckian framework. And with the backing of an inter international group of elites in science, politics, and business, he founded an organization called the Société Imperiale Zoologique de Acclimatation in 1854. Um, while providing a forum for research like other scientific societies, the real impetus behind the Societe lay in sponsoring agribusiness ventures, 
Um, to this end, a variety of domesticated species from around the world, such as yaks from Tibet or llamas from the Andes were imported to France with the hope that selective breeding and the pressure of acclimatization could produce literally the next major cash cow for French agriculture. And so in Isidore's view, this kind of bold entrepreneurial vision of science had outgrown what was then the dominant and purely academic institution in biology and time in Paris, the Musée National de Histoire Naturelle, with its famous garden, the Jardin des Plantes. Um, and um, it was anyhow also associated with his father, and he seems to have been eager to create his own mark in the realm of the scientific elite in Paris. And um, acclimatization zoology needed an institution all its own. And that's where the politician came in. Um, the politician who proved the key to him realizing his dream was also living in an even greater shadow of an ancestor. And that was Napoleon III, or really his name is Louis Napoleon. He called himself Napoleon III. Um, the son of Napoleon Bonaparte, or excuse me, the nephew of Napoleon Bonaparte. Um, Louis is um, the subject of Marx's famous essay, the 18th Brumaire of Louis Napoleon. And he was a right-wing populist whose political base in France um, was actually the small rural landowners, the former French peasantry. Um, and um, his political story is quickly a tangent that could grow really major. Um, the, the point that I'll only mention right now is just that he um, was elected as an outsider, a right-wing populist, and actually succeeded um, in converting his presidency into a dictatorship um, in Paris. In the, so it's an interesting case um, to discuss. Um, Despite um, owing his political career to the rural middle class, um, Napoleon, or at least his election, I should say, um, Napoleon III, the third's legacy is strongly connected to Paris and specifically unleashing his deputy uh, Baron Eugene Haussmann upon Paris. And, um, and Haussmann, of course, is a man that Walter Benjamin described as a demolition artist famously. And Haussmann raised the old medieval working class quarters of Paris, which had proven to be kind of hotbeds of revolutionary sentiment and replaced them with this kind of decadent consumers to dreamscape of a city that not only reinvented Paris itself, but I think many people in urban studies would argue contributed to the dominant notions of cityness um, that we still hold in our minds to the present days with the hegemonic idea of what an energetic city was supposed to be or look like in kind of capitalist sense. Um, Napoleon III and Isidore Geoffrey saint Hilaire, um, so their interest merged in this urban redevelopment. Um, and specifically in a project to renovate an area known as the Bois du Boulogne. Um, here's an image of it. Um, the Bois du Boulogne was a former royal hunting preserve um, on the western edge of Paris. Um, and it was rebuilt in, under Napoleon III and Haussmann as a park, as a public park on, on, at a, on a very massive scale. And um, it actually takes up a significant portion of the land area on the western side of Paris. Um, Napoleon III had not been particularly engaged with Haussmann's remaking of the boulevards, train stations, and public spaces, but the Bois de Boulogne, um, the Bois de Boulogne was an exception. Um, he saw the project as a way to compete with Hyde Park in London, which had made an impression on elite travelers around the world, and especially many French aristocratic immigrants who were part of his network. And so a newly, newly renovated Bois de Boulogne, which was built in kind of a fashionable, what was called the Jardin Anglais style, literally the English garden style, would give the par parks of Paris a much needed update. Um, and, and with the help of Isidore Geoffrey Saint Hilaire, his idea was that this park could also be something that London and other global metropoles did not have with, with Hilaire's um, vision of a new kind of urban space. Um, the vision that Hilaire pitched to Napoleon III seemed to cover every political need in a single fix. Um, here's a plan of it. Um, equal parts public attraction, part zoo, part laboratory, and part landscape park. The Jardin d'Acclimatation was both a popular attraction for the urban masses and tied to an elite international society of scientists, industry magnates, and political leaders. It had the, the society that um, actually presided over the park and essentially governed it um, was a kind of who's who's list of a time that went beyond the scientific elite, like I mentioned, to include many business and political leaders. Um, it would be a prestigious space in that it was associated with research conducted by internationally reputed scientists, but it would be politically pragmatic as well because the agricultural innovations developed there um, could 
play provide direct benefits to Napoleon III's overwhelmingly rural base, which he, um, even as um, a dictator, sought to keep um, happy. There, it was therefore easy to understand why Napoleon III personally intervened in the construction project, the Bois de Boulogne project, to cede um, 19 of the 872 hectares of the project to um, the society. Um, and so the Jardin Acclamation, here's another image of what it looked like. Now, I haven't said this yet, so it may come as a surprise, but the Jardin de Acclamation was never intended to display humans. It was opened in 1860, and it was described um, by the society itself as an undertaking that was at once a laboratory as well as a theater. Um, it contained pastures for exotic species such of ruminants, such as reindeer, camels, and llamas, a glass dome grand serre. Here's an image of that, um, which um, included tropical birds, tropical mammals, and tropical plants. Um, and it actually had the first aquarium in Europe, in the continent at least. And in a manner um, that kind of was in keeping with the visual culture of Paris at the time, it had a series of twisting paths and artfully wrought landscapes that presented visitors with a kind of maze to get lost in. Um, you would turn a corner, visitors would turn a corner and encounter kind of these playfully surreal surprises, um, such as like things like this, like a wagon pulled by an ostrich. Um, so the aquarium, um, which was described by one commentator as containing, quote, seascapes and caverns of the most chimerical and picturesque strangeness, um, was the subject of particular public fascination. And it was reportedly visited by Jules Verne a short time before he wrote 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. At a time when impressionism and immersion, um, or excuse me, um, or at a time when impressionism and, um, and early surrealism were just a short stroll away in the neighborhood of Montmartre, also on the west side of Paris, and early experiments with film and light were introducing the public to the trompe l'oeil to crowds. So the idea there was a whole kind of, the, the kind of visual spectacle involving artifice, light, and film was a kind of emerging area in Paris at this time and very much part of the visual culture of the city. Um, the Jardin de Acclimatation offered another form of sensory adventure for Parisians associated with surreal immersion into a kind of storybook-like world of adventure, discovery, and exoticism. Um, but war would change all this. Um, Napoleon III was tricked by Otto von Bismarck into declaring war on militarily superior Prussia, and in 1871 essentially saw Paris destroyed twice over, um, first by a brutal Prussian siege, which according to legend, many animals in the Jardin were consumed by starving, the starving populace of Paris, actually. And the second um, in the bloody suppression of the Paris Commune, which occurred on the heels of the siege. And that actually saw fighting in the garden itself and several members of the garden staff were killed in the fighting. Um, and so in an attempt to rebuild what had been um, a popular but only narrowly, pro excuse me, a popular but only narrowly profitable venture. The, this was a for-profit operation um, and it had always just barely eked by at the, up until this point. A third generation scion of the family, Albert Geoffrey Saint-Hilaire, um, so this would be the grandson of the original Saint-Hilaire, looked for other options. And as he sought to rebuild the menagerie, he transacted the, the, you know, the, the animal collection after the commune, he transacted with a man named Carl Hagenbach, who, let me show, who's well known in the history of zoos, actually. Um, he was a German impresario who built a global network in the exotic animal trade. Um, often I've seen him, you know, there's statues of him in Berlin and so on, and he's sometimes seen as depicted as this kind of caring, nurturing figure for nature, but he was a human smuggler actually as well. And um, he had experimented with a concept of bringing troops of people um, who were associated with his animal displays, who would take part in dances and sometimes ritual performances and other displays in kind of native garb. And this had been tried out in Berlin. And of course, the idea of human um, displays weren't altogether new. Obviously, um, Sergei Bartman, or known sometimes as the Hot and Top Venus, was earlier in the 18th century. So it wasn't uh, unknown idea, but it was still a relatively new and fringe idea. And Hagenbach sought to see this as a new opportunity. And the leaders of the Jardin de Acclimatation saw this as an opportunity as well. And it's through Hagenbach that people from different indigenous groups in the Northern Sudan were displayed as quote Nubians, indigenous Laplanders from Finland were displayed, or indigenous Sami were displayed as Laplanders, um, and a group of Greenland Inuit were exhibited as Eskimo and were brought 
to the Jardin de Acclamation in 1878 and 1877. Um, this is a poster, a promotional poster from one of these displays. Uh, initially, many of the zoologists of the Jardin, the Jardin, right, who, who had presided over its previous incarnation, were actually highly skeptical of this. And they saw it for what it was, I think, which is as a kind of Barnum-esque hokum. Um, and indeed, it was this precisely, this was the kind of entertainment that Hagenbeck had sought to provide with his acts in Germany. Um, Geoffroy Saint-Hilaire, however, searched for and found formal scientific justification for these human displays from a new quarter. The discipline of anthropology was newly emerging in France at the time and little known in the eyes of the public. Paul Broca, who I'll show a picture here, talk more about in a few moments, Adolf Bloch, and other members of the Young Society d'Anthropologie de Paris had not been involved in the Jardin d'Acclimatation prior to this. Um, but they saw the displays as opportunities initially to take craniometric measurements of human subjects and other observations for the advancements of their polygenistic theories of racial difference. Um, over the years to come, displays at the Jardin d'Acclimatation would form the basis for dozens of articles promulgating racial polygenism, and France would become a center of this particular school of thought. The anthropologists soaked up the limelight in the process. Newspaper articles, which offered extensive coverage of the displays, often described the anthropologists as part of the spectacle itself, quoting them extensively, and even describing their comings and goings in their panels before the crowds. By 1890, another, an, an author of a tourist guide would immediately connect the discipline to these exhibits of the Jardin writing, quote, there is hardly any science more fashionable than ethnography. This is an Today, does it not have its annals, its journals, its travel books, its museums, its lectures, and its curious exhibitions at the Jardin Zoologique de Acclimatation? So the new discipline had staked its claim in this and built its fame on human exhibitions of the kind of most degrading variety. Um, so now I'm going to kind of change gears and talk about people who are involved in the exhibitions. Um, so this man's name is John Pilcher. Um, he, in many ways, um, in learning his life story, he seemed almost destined to become a traveler, a wonder, a translator, or a man kind of finding, striving to find a place between two worlds. Um, he was born in the Nebraska Territory in the 1830s to a white fur trader named Joshua Pilcher and an Omaha woman named Popperine. Um, Pilcher's father left his mother soon after his birth, and soon after that, um, Poperin died, um, and so he was taken care of um, by the family of an Omaha chief named Big Elk. In young adulthood, um, Pilcher rekindled his connections with his biological father, who had gone on to become a regional superintendent of Indian affairs with the U.S. government. By leveraging his father's tribal position at the same time as um, um, were serving a go-between with his the, the US government through his father, Pilcher in a young age grew to become an economically successful trader, as well as a kind of political gatekeeper and go-between between the federal government and the Omaha tribe in Nebraska territory. And by the 1870s, he'd become sufficiently well known that the US Department of the Interior um, asked him to organize a group of 50 Omaha women, men and children, many of whom were part of his father's family to travel to Paris in 1883, to be part of an official visit coordinated by the Chester Arthur administration. Um, so this part of my project, by the way, I'm just getting into now, mainly because I found some sources and leads to learn more about these stories. So they're very incomplete, but my overall hope is to really decenter the narrative around the ex exhibitions as it's usually told and talk about it from the center of people involved like John Pilcher. Um, my story of Pilcher and his family runs somewhat cold around their arrival in Paris, but you can see John Pilcher is actually three people over, I guess, I always forget how things go left and right. And when you put images on the screen, but he's, I think on my screen, he's the fourth person from the, the right. Um, um, this exhibit, um, which was known by the, the derogatory name of Paul Rouge was enormously popular with the public. Um, during their stay in Paris, which was paid for actually by the US government. Um, a Pilcher and his family were photographed by an ethnograph ethnographic photographer named Roland Bonaparte, who is yet another relative of Napoleon. Um, he was that grandson of Napoleon's brother in a se series of very famous portraits. Um, today, these images, here is a couple examples of his family in, photographed in Paris are often reposted on social media and I noticed in Pinterest sites um, that stress Native American pride 
And contemporary users often tag the images with comments expressing the beauty and the nobility of the individuals in them. Um, at the time, however, Bonaparte's portraits, which I found along with accompanying notes in the archives of the Société d'Anthropologie de Paris, um, were taken from specific angles and used specific poses meant to highlight racial difference. They, meant, they were meant to use the camera to make race visible and knowable. Um, 19th century racists, scientific racists I found, had what art historians, and I'll talk more about this in a minute, call a period eye that looked at human bodies through a trained gaze that fixed on bodily proportions and subtle and then often today viewed scientifically trivial anatomical differences between people to find desperately seeking, it seemed, race um, in concrete form. Um, what I don't know much about yet, um, and though and I'm still early on this, is what Pilcher and his fellow travelers said, thought, or did while they were in Paris. The Pilcher family's oral histories speak about the journey with a, low, a general level of pride, um, but they do not dwell much on what um, Pilcher experienced. Did Pilcher, his kin, and friends know that they were getting into when they arrived in the Jardin? Evidence from similar cases suggests they might not have, but we don't know for sure. For example, one of the players on France's 1998 World Cup soccer team, this is the previous World Cup team, um, Christian Cambou has discussed with the press his discovery that his great grandparents were displayed at the Jardin as well. Carambou's story is the reason that many members of the French public have heard of the Jardin d'Acclimatation actually. His great grandfather, who um, Carambou and his family come from, the, from, from New Caledonia and the South Pacific, um, and his great grandfather was brought um, actually to a much later exhibition at the garden that was sort of a one off compared to the other displays I've talked about. It was actually held in 1931, part of the colonial exhibition. And according to Carambou, 1931, his father was offered to come to France to represent his family at the colonial exhibition. Um, quote, he, or excuse me, he, my great grandfather, um, and this is Carambou speaking, he departed like a hero like an ambassador of his people. And, when he was and then he was exhibited as a caged animal in a human zoo in the Jardin d'Acclamation. What disappointment, what humiliation. And this experience has like fundamentally shaped Carambou's um, politics and notion of self. Um, he actually back, this is way before recent events, back in the 90s, he was um, in the news for not singing the Marseillaise in the French soccer team when, before games. He was a controversial figure and often looked at this experience as one of the reasons he, um, made that kind of protest before the, the game started. Um, but according to Karen Boo's family story, his great grandfather was essentially tricked and deceived into taking part in the colonial exhibition, which he described as humiliating. Um, this happened to many participants and could have been the experience of the Pilchers, though it's not recorded as such by the Pilcher family. And this is something I still need to get to. And I'm probably, I've been doing purely archival work and it's obviously needs to be done, I think is to reach out and speak to people um, for the next stage of this project. In some cases, um, individuals um, involved in the displays amassed a considerable degree of fame on their own, actually. And though in some ways, um, these were often ways in which fame and notoriety were achieved following um, very narrow racialized scripts. In the 1893 Paris World's Fair, a display that had originally been at the Jardin d'Acclamation was moved to the Champ de Mars. And it was themed around the Kingdom of Dahomey, which is now Benin in West Africa. And it featured a royal co court um, including a prince as well as an entourage. And as part of the fanfare linked to the display, a race was organized between a group of porters who served the king and a group of men who are described in the media as ideal working class representations of French masculinity. Um, described, quote, as a black versus white race, um, unquote, the event entailed an encumbered 100 kilometer run that came down to a much publicized and racialized tete a tete contest between, um, here's the two men involved, a 27 year old former soldier and native of the working class French Parisian neighborhood of La Villette named Suster, and a 23 year old man named Ahiri, who was born in the Benin town of Agoué and, a, and who was a servant to the Dahomeyan royal household. Um, the contest was only suspenseful in the beginning, however. Ahiri won by such a great margin that by the time he finished, he was able to run several victory laps over a little loop at the very end of the track at the end of the course with his arms held high above his head to the delightful roar of the crowd. Um, Suster was four kilometers behind Ahivi at the end, and the newspaper quoted him as four kilometers behind Ahivi doing better than the other whites, and was greeted with warm applause. Of course, such accounts do little to upend racial ideologies promulgated at these displays. Ahivi, who became a celebrity for a time after that in French media, is described as, quote, a beautiful man in the newspaper, but he is viewed less as a beautiful individual than as an example an exemplar of a race in many ways, in the way he's talked about. His performance as um, excellent 
as it may have been at an individual level, seems to fulfill his social positions. And he was in fact, you know, the media dubbed King of the Porters. Um, his victory um, celebrated as, act, as, as an act of impressive individual achievement is also read and in, in, in presented the media as confirming a racial hierarchy and not upending it. Um, finally, Ahivi and John Pilchers held, held, I think I could both say, they held relatively privileged positions in the display, at least vis-a-vis -vis to other people in it. And this is one of the reasons I think I've actually been able to learn about their stories relatively quickly in this project. I'm still pretty early in it. Um, many of the other people involved in, in this project endured far greater sufferings and had very different situations that brought them to the displays. And probably um, one example is an 1881 um, display of an extended family of Salcnam people from Tierra del Fuego, Argentina. Um, they were forcefully captured and held captive, likely under the direction of Hagenbeck, I suspect, um, and brought to the Jardin de Acclimatacion, and after that to Berlin. The Salcnam people of the Tierra del Fuego in Argentina had been the targets of a violent genocidal campaign. And in the midst of this war, that's the situation in which they were brought to Paris and um, presented as cannibals was, was how they were marketed to the crowd. The anthropologist who conducted measurements on them did little to abuse, disabuse the public of this myth. Of course, they could have believed it for themselves for how little they knew or seemed to care of the cultural history of the Salkanam people. Um, with a short time, within a short time of arriving in Paris, um, five members of this group, including one child, died of illness. The anthropologist Lyon Manouvrier, um, I'll show a picture of him in a second, here, um, before it, an examination of one of the children who had, who had died. Um, and though a chilling level of clinical indifference often characterized the anthropologist writing about the people in these displays, um, Manu Vrier actually broke with his normal practice in this case and documented the inhumane conditions of the self were living them, describing them as being made by a quote, Barnum. That's what the word he uses for the, this man who is a business a sort of business mogul who was essentially a human trafficker um, to live in a cold, unheated warehouse while not being given any winter clothes. Manu Rie would actually probably be transformed by this event because he would go on to become one of the few anthropologists in the next decade who would condemn the displays across the board. But not many did, but he was one of the first to do it and must have probably had to do with this experience, I'm sure. Um, based on what I've read so far, the Selknam exhibitions seems to have represented the most cruel example of the events of the Jardin de Acclimatacion, but we know that people in the other events probably endured similar treatment. Um, we also know of cases where individuals were paid as performers and worked in more or less organized groups, so there was no uniform way in which the logistics of these displays happened. Um, this aspect um, of my project is probably, or learning more about this aspect of this project, including the economies underlying it, is probably the most important to me at a basic moral level. Um, after all, most research on exhibitions has tended to kind of replicate the colonial objectifying dynamic underlying the displays in the first place, and that they often marginalize the very people at the center of these displays as objects. So they often, much of the critical writing about the World's Fairs does nothing to really de shift the objectifying gaze of the fairs themselves. I'm hoping it's a challenge to try to move past that a little bit in this project um, as much as I can. Um, my hope is that I'll find more details on these particular stories. And although they're hard to find, there's a lot that I haven't opened yet, so to speak, or a lot of places I know I can't search. Um, but predictably, of course, um, the people who watch these events, members of the French public and journalists, um, reacted in a wide variety of ways. Um, Marcel Proust, writing in, in In Search of Lost Time, has a very memorable scene in which Madame Blaton visits the Jardin de Acclimatation, Acclimatation and casually hurls a racial epithet at a man from, from Sri Lanka who was part of a so-called Senegalese exhibition. The man shocks her by responding in French. You camel, he calls her. Um, the scene is a shocking scene because it, on one hand, it's sort of her racism is met with his sort of misogynistic attack on her. But at the same time, um, the joke in the scene is that it challenges the convention underlying the display as otherness. The setting of the display built an expectation amongst the public that the man in, it, in this case, the man in it was a distant other who due to extreme alterity would have no comprehension of her language or of the situation itself. In fact, his comeback improves the reverse is actually true. He understands his position and her language all too well. And it is she, not he, who is fooled by the Jardin de Acclimatation. Such a scene brings to mind, I think, Franz Fanon's diagnosis of colonialism 80 years later, in which um, 
it is the colonized who have a tendency to see through the facade and the cultural superstructure of the colonial order first. Um, and this, I wonder about as a lead to think about a way to think through these displays in many respects. Um, newspaper coverage of the events had a tendency to sanitize and or omit the back and forth interactions between the crowd and people in the displays. Um, when this happened, it was often described in judgmental terms by journalists who seemed to condemn the breakdown in theatrical conventions that, the made, that made the displays work in a kind of Goffman-esque sense. And indeed, it was precisely in cases where people in the display broke with character that journalists let loose with the most unbridled racial vitriol in their narratives. Um, the Dahomey exhibit, of which Ahivi I mentioned before had been a part, is a case in point. Um, depicting a royal court of the Fawn people, the display was led by a prince who eschewed native attire for European dress, including a jacket, a pipe, and a top hat. Newspaper reports seemed disappointed by this, along with the degree that children in the, the, children in the caravan were, quote, performing antics to entice the generosity of the crowd, or in other words, breaking with character in order to elicit donations from the audience. Um, such actions partially subverted the goals of the display since the individuals within them began to essentially define what the display was about in their own terms and kind of refused to be sort of just passive objects to distantly gaze upon. Newspaper reports acknowledged that the audience, and this is a quote, the audience, especially the women in the crowd, were good natured, quote, about this breach of decorum. It also referred to the moral controversy, or newspaper reports referred to the moral controversy over the degree to which people in the displays directed directly solicited the audience for money, which seems to have been a commonplace occurrence. The habit may have been distasteful, according to one journalist, but, or a news, this is just the newspaper editorial board, but the people in these displays, quote, have the right to receive money. After all, begging and the desire for money, it pointed out, seemed to be human universal, a practice that many Parisians were familiar with. And so this did not mean, however, that Le Petit Parisien looked upon such evidence of human universality as a source of solidarity. In fact, quite the opposite. To the contrary, reporting on the Dahomey exhibit was peppered with more judgmental language and kind of racial contrast. An, an Ashanti exhibit from Ghana called upon readers to quote, had a very different tone. This was a, um, this called upon readers to quote, study the quote, vigorous warriors with powerful musculature and the most beautiful black skin. The Ashanti, so I'll describe this. Sorry, being old fashioned and reading off paper, even though I'm on a screen. Um, the Ashanti display be featured choreographic, rit choreographed rituals, dances, and native costumes that evoked um, radical exoticism and otherness. I believe I have an image of it here. Um, in contrast to the points of familiarity referred to in the Dahomey exhibit, the Ashanti display constructed blackness as an object of desire, as and that visual as an object of desire and visual consumption for the European male gaze. Ashanti women were described by reporters as, quote, remarkably well-made, unquote, and, quote, half nude and adorned with jewelry worn with a certain level of coquetry, unquote. The differing social roles and the expectations of Ashanti women were subject of discussion as well. They, quote, were not, they were not, quote, kept in servitude, quote, one reporter wrote drawing an implicit comparison with French middle-class gender roles of the late 19th century. Indeed, as one script that was meant to be read aloud during a display read, this is what a presenter would say to the crowd, um, it is not rare for a chief, if obligated to a travel, to, to, to entrust direction of all his affairs with his wife. Until the chief returns, she can be the jailer, the prosecutor, the judge, the jury, and the executioner." Unquote. Such an abundant description of women's varying roles in Ashanti society was clearly meant to raise the ominous specter of an excess of power granted to women in French society. This dialectic quality of the woman's narrative as both objects of desire and yet harboring the potential of great dangers suffuses the, the entire narrative around the Ashanti display as a whole. As a society, we are, the, the narrator explains, the Ashanti are quote, brave, energetic, intelligent, and industrious but also, quote, capable of surpassing all limits of atrocity and folly, unquote. The message to the listeners and the audience is clear. Despite beauty, intelligence, and their respect, and, res and um, despite beauty and intelligence, the potential for violence is ever-present, and it must be contained and controlled. So anti-Blackness was ever-present as a flip side of colonial fetishism that was a part of these displays. Um, 
At times, however, aspects of the displays appear to upend racial and colonial hierarchies, albeit in subtle and somewhat limited ways. In a report covering one of the first displays at the Jardin in 1877, known as a Nubian display, it was made up of people from various ethnic groups across Ethiopia, Le Petit Parisien, um, one of the widely read newspapers at the time, expressed surprise at the healthy appearance of the supposedly, these supposedly inferior people, especially regarding their, quote, admirable teeth and hair compared to the Parisians in the crowd. They stood out in sharp contrast to, quote, people from France and Europe where, quote, men go bald and their teeth fall out at a far younger age, unquote. This prompted reflection on the part of the newspaper, quote, on this subject, can we not ask our readers if our civilization is responsible for some of our infirmities, unquote? Variance in gender and familial roles was a continual source of reflection and wonderment, as was already seen in the Ashanti display. A different but equally vivid example came from a Sami or Laplander display in 1878. A woman's magazine known as La Femme, whose targeted readership was urban, affluent, married bourgeois women, provided a very special in-depth coverage on the family life of the Sami or Laplanders as they were known in the display. It claimed Parisian women um, were united in their admiration of the quote, charming but strange cradle with the mother, with the, which mothers transports on their back that allowed babies to be with their mothers throughout the day while other tasks were conducted. These detailed drawings, which I realized I just now I didn't include, were, were included um, with pictures of the household and the apparatus for caring ch children in a manner clearly meant to evoke a kind of possibility or fantasy of such a social arrangement. In a time when middle and upper class women um, in this especially upper class, you know, in an urban context were expected to entrust caregiving to nannies and a time when children, and this was not because of work responsibilities, it would become of purely social roles expected of women. And a time when children were carefully, almost ritualistically, where time with children was carefully, almost ritualistically rationed among middle-class parents, the customs of the Sami are described in a tone of curiosity laced with a tinge of envy. Anthropological interest in these displays, as intense as it have been, was actually far more narrow than public writing about it. Anthropology at the time was by definition physical in France. And the primary point of interest were the bodies and to be more precise, the racial characteristics of the people in the displays. Behavior, culture, and custom were only of interest in so far as they could be linked to racial characteristics. After all, this was an era in which extreme biological determinism was at its peak. And it was precisely the scientific racist doxa that of course, Franz Boas famously rebelled against. Um, the way the anthropologist looked at this displays was one of the primary theoretical concerns for me in the overall project, but today I'm only going to allude to it briefly. I realized after encountering the writings of Broca and other members of the Society de Anthropology de Paris that art history might provide a fruitful science perspective on scientific racist practices. Um, because when I read the articles, I realized that they often focused on very arcane ways of looking at the body to prove the existence of something paradoxically that was supposed to be self-evident. Um, in examining the lectures, meeting minutes, and writings of the Société d'Anthropologie de Paris, I found art historian Michael Baxendahl's concept of the period I, a productive way to think about science in this era. Baxendahl sought to understand how the visual acuity of painter and public alike were socially and historically conditioned. So in his example, what one might call the period I of the time um, was, or a period I was carefully cultivated through training and expertise. In his example, um, for Baxendahl, for example, he focused on religious art in 15th century Italy. When, and so he would say, for example, when we look at a Fra Angelico, our eyes just fall on the faces of like a saint and other aspects that mark them as individuals who are pious. Um, that's how we look at a painting like that today. Um, but the Renaissance public looked at it in an entirely different way. They would look past the saint's presence who they often took for granted and look at things like the symmetry of geometric lines in the back of the painting, and sometimes even things like the hues of colors, which might give clues on how much money the patron had paid for the painting. So he, just, he pioneered that kind of focus of looking at paintings in a kind of socially embedded way. And nowhere does that kind of rationale then for me make sense, help me to make sense of these anthropologist views and what they were doing. Um, more clearly, the anthropologist named Gustave Le Bon. Um, Le Bon was obsessed with the racial identity of the ancient Egyptians. And while the 1877 Nubian display, which I discussed before, was underway, um, he recruited several people from the display for, to pose for photographs in a studio, manner to replicate the poses found on the walls of ancient Egyptian tombs. This sounds really absurd. Um, so right away, before we get into his findings, we should point out that his scientific method begins with creating essentially a piece of visual art. 
um, the key to scientific racism was actually making art. Um, this is an image that he made. Um, he saw himself as a photographer and ethnographic photography was a particularly specialized medium of this time, um, which I think these images are sometimes poorly understood today um, because the, in, the scientific racist interest in these images was quite distinct. Um, as was pointed out before, this medium um, sought to use the objective po objectifying power of the camera, which was newly discovered at the time, as a way to bring race to life in an image. Um, photography sought to make statements about racialization replicable and generalizable. It didn't matter to Le Bon's scientific peers that he was creating a highly aestheticized representation of another highly aestheticized representation, the image from an ancient Egyptian tomb. It was the power of the camera to reveal previously unseen truth, the power to present an abstraction such as race as concrete truth that made it an effective tool in the mind of scientists. The period um, I enters into this um, discussion also because of what was done with these images as well as the people being photographed. Um, Le Bon produced a series of minute measurements and then consulted documents um, containing the ancient Egyptian canon of proportions. Um, and found it scientifically meaningful to point out that it matched almost perfectly in publication. So then he would publish an article, he published articles about this attesting to the racial um, makeup of ancient Egyptians based on this kind of work. This was actually what the method was. Um, it seems strange, misguided, and if not amateurish, of course, um, uh, let alone obviously racist, that Le Bon would treat the Egyptian canon properties as a literal guide to body types of ancient Egyptians. But there was a tremendous faith amongst many of these anthropologists in the value of using artistic realism and classical works in particular as actually containing objective data that could be used to support not only the existence of races, but claims about multiple species of humanity. Um, these were racial polygenists after all. Even the most respected anthropologist of this lot, um, who by today's standards is Paul Broca, whose pioneering work on the brain is actually still very important for speech pathology and neurology. Um, um, even he um, spent time in the Louvre, carefully measuring the proportions of Greek and Roman statuary, and by his own admission, leaving left very confused about the racial makeup is, of his supposed European ancestors. Um, when one looks at what Le Bon and the other anthropologists were up to, um, we have to remember that one aspect of these displays, as much as I want to draw attention to the individuals who are in them, it's also really important to point out what actually this political cartoon pointed out in Paris at the time. Imagine you might have a hard time seeing what it says at the bottom of this political cartoon, but it essentially says, see, the real project here is to acclimatize the public. That is, these were sites making a certain, um, pre uh, this was very much about working on the French public and working a certain mindset, creating a certain racial worldview for the public. Um, Many of the zoologists associated with the Jardin Acclimatation, um, or let me back up for a minute. Um, I realize I'm running a little, time, a little low on time, especially if there's gonna be questions. So I'm just gonna rush my conclusion. So my apologies for that in advance. Um, but essentially, um, I think it's important to avoid the temptation to treat the passage of a long period of time as an insulation from moral judgment. After all, many of the zoologists of the time were very skeptical of these displays. And it, for their, that point, I think the moral burden is even more on anthropologists who went out of their way to justify these displays at the time. Um, and of course, there were anthropologists who had misgivings like Topinard and Manu Rie. Um, the public by and large flocked to these displays. Um, I, I mentioned you know, figures of 30,000 visitors coming in the busiest days. One display grew, drew 800,000 people over a period of a year. Um, and in that way, the emerging discipline of anthropology made its name to an international audience by joining in this cruel and degrading spectacle. And by and large, anthropology capitalized upon and benefited from this spectacle due to its growing visibility and prestige. And association with these displays, anthropology came to define itself conveniently um, as a discipline that curated, explained, and mediated otherness and exoticism to the public. I think that largely, frankly, remains true about the discipline's identity today. For all the post-colonial critique within the field directed at itself, when it attempts to market itself to the public, it often falls back on a role that was pioneered at the Jardin de Acclimatation in a slightly more sanitized form. Um, many anthropologists have called for the discipline to reassess its identity as a consequence of its colonial history for a long time. Um, this is arguably a call that began the moment decolonization started. Um, but I think one thing that's often taken for granted, and if you look at the displays in the field today, is the role of ocular centrism and the focus on the eye 
as a way in which anthropological knowledge is mediated or as with way in which the reliance on ocular centrism as part of anthropological ways of knowing, I think is a commonality between that time and this one. And maybe that has to do with another reason why the discipline has proven so hard to decolonize, even in an era when more anthropologists than ever are people, quote, form the former colonies. And this, in saying this, um, I'm paraphrasing Delmos Jones, who said a similar thing in the early 1970s. Um, so um, in the time ahead, what I really hope to do with this project is to bring about a reappraisal of not only how we see, um, but why we choose vision, what we gain from it, and what the consequences are as we work to reinvent our field based on a clear understanding of its cruel history. Thanks. So that is all for now. Thank you. Nice talk. Thanks. Now we move on to Q&A. So if anyone has any questions, they can raise their hand or put it in the chat or just unmute your mic. And Andy, do you still have to share your screen? So Oh, do I, is this still on? Here, I'll turn it off. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, um, I guess to answer um, one question that came up in the chat, um, Tamara Bray mentions um, Franz Boas, the American anthropologist, who's actually kind of known as an early proponent of an anti racist, I guess you could say proto anti racist, if that's the best way to put it, because he but I won't get into the details, but um, he was involved with a um, exhibit at the World's Fair in a, in a similar way. And um, yeah, the, I think for me, one of the kind, I guess in a farther stage of this project, after I feel like I have my head around the Paris case more, I'll talk about connections to the World's Fair. I think it's a pretty safe assumption based on what the World's Fair looked like that this inspired, predated the World's Fair, which is more well known. And the circumstances surrounding the World's Fair um, were actually somewhat different too. Um, and Boaz's involvement was a little bit different than the anthropologist in Paris. I'd probably be prepared to say that, but, um, but that's definitely a lot of similarity, so. Um, Tamara Bray has said in the chat, um, in addition to, I think, her, was looking at her, scrolled up a little bit. Um, Yes, he said for comparative material from US, your project brings to mind BOSS, the A-M-N-H, and um, Minnick, yep. a native of Greenlander uh, Inuit, who was kept in the museum basement as an exhibit, and also issued a uh, crowbar and the Lowy Museum in UCB. So that was a comment, but I don't know if you want to uh, respond yeah. to that. Yeah, those were later American examples of the, um, of, of that are similar to what I was speaking about. And I guess I can answer that in addition to uh, Marsha's question about the hot and hot Venus or Sergio Bartman. And um, I would say that um, one of the ways that I'm attempting to approach this um, is by looking at this, um, these displays, I mean, for I guess one big difference is that the, the Jardin d'Acclimatation was a space that had these displays rotating out ongoing for about three decades. And um, so there was just a level of duration that made these displays part of the urban life of Paris. And they were a permanent fixture designed to appeal to a very broad public with engagement by academia. Um, and so um, the there's a lot of overlap with these previous displays, but those kinds of emphasis on the mass public, as well as the early formation of the discipline of anthropology are the main entry points that I have for talking about them, especially when in comparison to the hot and hot Venus example. Um, in terms of why the public flocks to these displays, um, I wish I had a better answer other than to say that there was an appetite for exoticism in the late 19th century public. Also, I think that, um, the displays were part of the, the public was broken into different parts and people had different sort of points of interest in these displays. 
Um, the displays were lo located on the west side of Paris and they're relatively inexpensive to go to, um, especially on weekdays. And so they would be a part of a standard walking itinerary of a wealthy person on the west side of Paris who might stroll through them casually because they were almost always active. They were a permanent part of the city. Um, the, um, for working class Parisians who came from the opposite end of the city, they would have been bigger attractions and destinations. Um, so they were, the public kind of, they were viewed in different ways by different oceans of the public and part of different people's routine, routines for moving through the city. Um, but I, I would, I'm still looking for a better answer as to why they were so popular. They exceeded the popularity of the original, the museums or, or the, the Jardin's original offerings, right? Which were just, were animals from different parts of the world. And there is, um, there's a question from, a comment from uh, Elena Past. Uh, thanks so much. Interesting. The question about uh, ocular centrism at the end. Yeah. Did you find evidence of other senses being involved? That's yeah, I think, no, I, I think that I'm trying to be um, as sort of multi-century as possible as I understand these displays. Um, the two-dimensional nature of historical documents forces you to prioritize the eye, which is a challenge to work against. And a lot of the compelling evidence is photo photography, but the displays themselves were experiences, right? They were not people. And they, um, a lot of the writing about it talks about sounds, um, mainly sound um, in terms of music and things like that associated with the displays. But I'm still trying, and I'm not entirely self-satisfied yet. <laughs> I don't know if entirely self-satisfied is the right word, but I'm not quite content yet with my own treatment of that. And I wanna kind of keep thinking about the way that other senses are talked about in the display. So I really appreciate that question. Alain de Bateau's uh, complimented you for interesting thoughts and said it brought to mind some of the 19th century writings on Appalachia and the situation of the Appalachian mountain people as archetypal Anglo-Saxons. That was, that was a comment yeah. From Alain Bateau. yeah, one of the most interesting thing actually about these displays to kind of build on that comment is that when I initially began this project, I had a framework of thinking about these as colonial exhibitions that were primarily focused on people who were from the former French colony or from the at that time current French colonies. And what I immediately found were two things. One is that most of the displays were from people outside of the French Empire. And many of them, the displays, some of the most popular ones I talked about ones were people who were not of African origins or South American origins or not people who were of Asian origins, not people in a short who were classically viewed as other racial others to Europeans. So for example, there was this tremendous interest and discussion of displays of gauchos or, or like, like basically herders or ranchers like cowboys from Argentina um, whose racial identity was seen as sort of mixed. There was um, a tremendous interest in the Sami exhibit who had sort of a marginal Europeanness. So the way that race was talked about with regards to the French empire surprised me a little bit. And um, I mean, not to say that it interrupted these hierarchies or, or overturned them, but it showed a picture of the way that this thinking was that was broader than I had known about before. Um, so, yeah. Um. There's a question from Jessica, the sort of um, said that she reminded she was reminded of the work of Francine Hirsch on Soviet displays of the people of the USSR, and she's curious about what parallels there might be uh, looking at Soviet ethnography and anthropology. I don't know if you answered that question yet. My answer is I need to look at, I think I need to look at Soviet anthropology because that seems like a really interesting parallel. And um, certainly there's the, the, I think the ways in which otherness was talked about in the Soviet over the Russian overland empire has a lot of parallels. And so that would be a really fruitful place for me to work. So I'll definitely check that out. Um, I was looking at, um, I'm looking at um, Claudio Verani's question too about um, Catholic morals in France. And that's a really great question because it brings up the split in the French public, which I did not address. And on the fact that these displays, often by virtue of the sexualization of the people in them, the way they were talked about as, I mean, they were imagined, of course, by a French public as sexualized. Um, 
would be viewed by many as risque. And in fact, the anthropologists themselves who are ardent evolutionists and in many cases kind of their political views fell on the more what you would call the Republican, which, okay, we are in, we're in 19th century France, so it's very different vocabulary, but would be called a more secular Republican view, put them often at odds with more conservative Catholic French people. So that's another aspect is I'm talking about scientific racists, but the left and right that you might expect is not operant in this case. And in fact, these were, um, would have been viewed as secular left leaning. Well, left is a broad term, secular Republican um, scientists. So actually um, the, with their writings, their worldview, and in some cases, the frameworks underlying these displays would have conflicted with the values of really traditional Catholics. Um, how that actually worked in terms of the French public is something I, I'll, I'll learn more about, you know. Um, but um, it's, it's a good, great question. I haven't seen examples of moral condemnation from a Catholic perspective. Um, and finally, oh, sorry. There's a question from Bob Hawley, which gives me a chance to say hello to, to Bob. I've not seen and heard from him for a, a long time. Uh, he asks, uh, in the American Wild West shows, do you know if the cowboys quotes and Indians quoted or treated differently? Yeah, I, so I know that in the, the, well, I haven't studied the labor situation of the Wild West shows as detailed as I've looked at these. My understanding of them is that they, first of all, they did travel and tour in France and they were tremendously popular. Um, my sense is that they were more formal showbiz type arrangements, but I mean, someone who knows that history better than me would probably, you know, would speak to it better. One thing I will say about the, the Wild West shows that were popular this time is that they were part, they actually, came to supplant these shows, not supplant, replace these shows um, at these exhibitions. Um, the sort of, the kind of paradigm of these exhibitions is that they were scientific um, exhibitions meant for public consumption and sort of, but by the 1890s, the things like Buffalo Bill's Wild West show had become more common in France and that kind of act had become very popular with the public. And in fact, the organizers of the garden started to market these displays in a way that was more like that, more kind of Barnum-esque and more overtly entertainment focused. In fact, shortly after that, these displays of the garden kind of gradually waned and fell off by, by about 1908. They had mostly stopped except for that isolated example in 1931 that I spoke about. So, um, those Wild West shows actually were a part of this story, although I can't speak to the direct labor conditions in them. And I think we've exhausted all the questions in chat. If there's somebody else who has a question and wants to raise their hands. Well, I really appreciate this feedback for a new project. It's only, to be honest with you, I think the second time I've talked about it publicly so far. So I'm just very, very new. Um, so I really appreciate this feedback on it. Oh, is, is Marsha Richmond's hand up? Yeah, probably. Uh, I, okay, Marsha. Mar Marsha, do you have a question? You have to unmute yourself. I, think I see her talking, but uh, I think she's. Still I don't think the microphone is working. <laughs> that might be it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, Marsha, while you're setting that up, I'm going to answer Lucilda's like question really quickly. Um, Lucilda has this great question about whiteness. That's actually a really interesting thing to think about. I'm really careful. You have to be very careful when you try to take concepts notions from American racial history and, and talk about them in France. So like whiteness, as we talk about in America, um, of course, there's this tremendous literature specifically talking about antebellum South and 19th century US history on whiteness. Um, I'm going to be very cautious as I use that term and talk about it as a normalizing term in France. Not that it's not relevant, but that it's a very different situation that comes out of the colonial encounter but I'm gonna definitely think through it. And um, many people writing about racism in France have been cautious about importing concept of whiteness to France mm -hmm. um, in particular, but not that I'm gonna bypass it entirely, but I'd be very cautious about how I use the term and theorize it. Okay, well, thank you so much, uh, uh, Andy. I, I, I think uh, 
from the chat and from the fact that so many people stayed almost to the to the very end is an indication of how absorbing your talk was. Um, Kennedy has a little spiel and then um, she'll, she'll, she'll let you go. <laughs> Yes, um, thank you so much. Uh, this talk was very profound. I think um, I can speak for everyone. We're excited and we want to know more. So we definitely will be uh, sending an invite, hopefully uh, next year for brown bags, because this research is very important. And um, we're happy that we could have at least been the second uh, place to host this talk. And um, it is being recorded. So we'll be posting this talk onto our website um, by the end of the week. So if anyone wants to go back or have any questions or anything like that, um, it is being recorded. Um, but on behalf of the Humanity Center, as a small token of our gratitude, we have two gifts for you that we wish we could have given to you in person. It's a mask and a journal. Um, oh, we cool. give them to all of our speakers. It has our Humanity Center logo on it. I'll be reaching out to you individually. Like I said, towards the end of the semester to safely get these to you but thank you so much great talk we love the photographs because it really puts a face to name to a story to history so very well crafted presentation and thank you well attended as well thank you all for staying on and coming um yeah this is why we do what we do so thank you so much and if anyone has any more questions or anything um we look at the chat one more time give you a last minute <laughs> But um, Dr. Edwards, if you have anything else to say? Well, nothing other, other than to thank uh, Andy and thank the audience. And just to remind them that uh, this material can be used in their classes. Uh, we don't, we have a, a large archive of uh, talks, uh, Brumbach talks going back um, in the early 90s since this uh, series started. and. Uh, we started recording them. And uh, so there are lots of talks that uh, can be used in, in classes. I know that I have used uh, some of my uh, linguistic uh, talks from, from my linguistic colleagues uh, in, my, in my classes and, and, and it helped to emphasize important uh, points that I was teaching. So thank you all for coming and um, uh, have a safe rest of the day. And I look forward to seeing some of you uh, next week when we have, I think, three talks. And then um, for the rest of the um, academic year, and then we'll be back next year with our Brownback series. Thank you all so much for giving me the space to uh, do the talk. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. Everyone have a good one.